Hello, everybody. Um, this is Peter O'Rourke, Executive Director of NAPSIG Foundation. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today on what I think is going to be a really exciting um, virtual prep tech talk training for, for all of you. Um, our pre presenter today is Do uh, Joel Toito uh, from Data Miner. Um, for those of you who uh, are familiar with our annual summit, um, Inspire, uh, Joel uh, Data Miner is a sponsor of that summit. So uh, just a big thank you to Data Miner for that, uh, that support. Um, and Joel gave a very similar presentation um, in October of last year, I'm sorry, November of last year in, um, um, in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I, I happened to sit in on that session and I thought it was really, um, really compelling information. And I thought it'd be great to share that with the broader community of folks who could not attend the summit. Um, so with that, we'll just dig into a couple opening things. So Joel, if we go to the next slide. Um, just a couple uh, uh, basic information and reminder for folks who um, have not participated in the past. Um, these sessions, everyone, all the participants are muted so that we, um, you can have noise in the background and it doesn't interrupt your fellow participants. Um, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Um, we will be monitoring those. And as always, um, this recording as well, as well as a copy of the slides and any associated links will be available next week on our NAPSIG Foundation website. Uh, next slide, Joel. Um, again, if you're not familiar with NAPSIG Foundation, I'm not sure how you found your way here, but if you're not familiar with NAPSIG, um, we're a 501c nonprofit. We've been around remarkably getting really close to 20 years, which um, all that means is I'm old. Um, but we've been around for a long time. We've got over 20,000 um, public safety agencies that are part of our network, um, combining both um, technical as well as operational and, and in-between um, folks. Um, we are mostly, um, that membership is mostly in the US, but it does span the globe. Um, we actually have some folks from at least Canada and Trinidad on this call today. Um, and really what we focus on is making sure all the trainings and tools and best practices and, and that really everything we do um, is provided at no cost to you, our public safety community. Um, and that's through generous support from sponsors like Data Miner um, and Joel. So, um, you know, again, a big thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters, as well as through grants and um, uh, cooperative agreements and the such from federal agencies. So we couldn't we couldn't offer everything we do at no cost without that support. Um, next slide. And we like to give a snapshot of, of what these uh, participant in this um, uh, prep tech talk looks like. So we're actually above 170. So that's that's exciting. Um, and you can see we really you know span the country as well as those dots in Canada and um, Trinidad. And you can see just from the affiliation, we're, we're really heavy on um, emergency management on this um, particular session. And um, we have a lot from the fire service, SAR, law, law enforcement and elsewhere. Um, and with that, and without um, further ado, Joel, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Very All right. Much. Thank you, Peter. And thanks for uh, having me and, and allowing me to talk about this topic. And hello, everyone. I had a great time at NAPSIG back in the fall and happy to talk about the same topic again. And just so folks know, this is really, and I have an agenda right here. It's really meant to be an overview of AI and how AI has impacted and can act, impact um, real-time event detection, specifically uh, for a lot of the work that you guys, you all do, which is, you know, uh, crisis response, re emergency response. So the outline of this talk is there's really three sections, <clears throat> and I'm going to apologize in advance for my voice getting over a cold. So I might be uh, doing a little liquids and cough drops during during the courses, but the first time I just want to do a level set on real time event detection and alerting. What does that mean? Uh, what can it mean for you? And then introduction to AI, and this is the bread and butter of the talk. Talk look at examples of AI in the real world. Give you a brief history, a bird's eye view. And um, what it takes to develop an AI system. And, and with those building blocks in mind, let's go into AI for real-time event detection. And um, while this work, obviously, while the, a lot of the work that I'm going to be describing is um, obviously influenced by the work that we do at Data Miner, but I'm going to try to cast it in this sort of generic way of this is, this is AI for real-time event detection. And, um, you know, a little bit about me, I have been working in AI for uh, a, probably a little bit longer than NAPSIG's been around, actually uh, quite a bit longer. And uh, it's a 
maybe like 1.2 NAPSIG lifetimes. And um, my, I have a specific background in natural language processing, which is a subfield of AI. And it's, uh, you know, when I talk to my parents about what I do, I say, we get computers to understand language. And um, through my career prior to, to data miner, I worked in a lot of education for um, using AI or NLP to improve education, um, whether it's getting a computer to automatically score your TOEFL or GRE essays, or all the way to leading research at Grammarly, where we're trying to collect uh, your writing online, to also other things such as detecting hate speech on internet forums, and the list goes on and on. So I've been at Data Miner for about three years and have been in this world of uh, crisis response and real-time alerting, and it's been really exciting. Um, so uh, last time I was at NAPSIG, I was happy to learn from everyone uh, and so I'm happy to do this uh, webinar today. All right, let's get into it. First section. Um, I'm going to just minimize my window here. <clears throat> so what we have here is a timeline. There was a severe weather event in uh, New Orleans about a year ago. And uh, areas around NOLA experienced severe thunderstorms and destruction from a tornado. And what this timeline is, is actually a snapshot of several of the events that Data Miner sent out using its first alert product, and um, which is part of our real-time alerting platform. And it's not all of the alerts that we sent out for that area, but just enough that I can fit in this slide. And what you can see here, if you go from left to right, is this timeline going from March 22nd, um, the afternoon to about a day later, where people were expecting the thunderstorms, the warnings were going out, um, people were observing the clouds coming in. Then, then after things hit, then there's people are assessing the damage, reporting things on specific streets of specific towns. The governor declares a state of emergency. And what you can see here, there's a lot of disparate sources that are being tapped in to make this timeline that hopefully succinctly describes um, what transpired. And, um, and, and if you are someone using the data miner product or getting any type of real-time alerting, you're going to get these events popping up in your phone or your email, you know, as soon as they come in, every few seconds, every few minutes, um, and it's stuff that would have just popped up online within a minute or so ago, ideally. Um, and so, what you can see here is the sources coming from social media, coming from the weather service, coming from the government, more social media, from news outlets, and it, it aggregates everything in, in one place. Um, and doing that requires by hand, if you're just a human doing it, it's really challenging because you have to have all these sources coming in. You have to have be, have access to those sources in the, in the first place. And if it's a really um, large event, there could be a lot of noise in there, a lot of people talking about it, but without it, without the events, that, the things they're talking about actually being actionable. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of real-time alerting. So when we say event detection, um, it's 2023, and really over the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's been an explosion of online sources that produce essentially billions and billions of signals, or you can say messages a day, um, across different modalities, whether it's text or images or video or sensor data, et cetera. And different sources could be social media, blogs, news, sensor data, the list goes on and on. And it's a, it's a wide swath of stuff. And, you know, if you're dealing with text across different languages, and what this presents is a real rich source of information for detecting and then alerting on events in real time. So while I, I would say to, it's great to, to be in 2023 because there's so much information coming in, people are really engaging with the world and, and writing about it, commenting on it in different ways, whether formal or informal, but it also presents some challenges because as you see, it's billions and billions. That's a lot to munch through. And a couple examples of some of the things that, you know, could get picked up. And I, you know, these are actual real social media messages. So we are trapped with large amounts of surge outside our door, downtown Fort Myers flooding from Hurricane Ian, hashtag FLWX, or my house surrounded by floods in Longfort. And those are great messages that we'd love to, to pass along to uh, first responder organizations. You have the location, you know, the nature of the event. Um, and you have people actually um, needing help, right? And that's, and that can help direct resources accordingly. Of course, there's no free lunch, and I'll probably say that at least one other time during this talk, where um, there's a lot of people going to be talking about other things, such as not enjoying the Fetterman Oz debate. Nope, not relevant to any sort of crisis response. On the other hand, you could have someone posting, a storm is coming, about to stream Taylor Swift's new album. And, you know, a storm is mentioned, there's a picture of a fire. And those are things from a very naive perspective that a machine or maybe even a human in a rush might say, all right. They mentioned storm and there's a fire that's probably indicative of something happening. 
Um, but clearly it's not necessary for first responders to go somewhere to engage. So when one is defect detecting events in real time, we essentially want to send real time alerts on hundreds of different events type. It could be comprising thousands and thousands and thousands of different alerts a day to all of our clients. And that means identifying, not only saying like, hey, we think this event um, is going to be of interest to somebody. We also want to identify the who, the what, the where, the when in the message, no matter the modality or the language. And it's really about crafting that story about what happened. Um, because the messages that come in could just be a single photo, or it could be um, from a bystander who's writing in a rush, that they're on the run. And, and really, we want to make sure that any alert that goes out is understandable um, to who's going to be receiving it. But when you go back to the my number where there's billions and billions of these messages coming in um, you know, a minute or so, it's really like pulling a needle out of a haystack. And it's just impossible to get humans to process that much information in such a short amount of time. Because as soon as they got through a fraction of that, the next minute would pop up. And, and then you'd be missing out on um, events that you'd want to action on. And so there's a real opportunity in this day and age to sort of combine AI scale with human expertise or domain knowledge to really have a great collaboration, a one-two punch in detecting events in real time. And, and that's essentially what we do at Dataminer is we have a system, and I guess you, I know I use the Dataminer icon there, that takes in 500,000 plus sources spanning social media, news blogs, sensor data, and more, and says, let's pull the needle out of the haystack from them. Let's identify important information about them, where it's located, uh, what type of event it is, and the list goes on and on, and then use that information to craft an alert, which is essentially a one to two sentence summary of that event. It's in English, no matter what the original language was. It's information precise, so there's no extraneous information um, that could distract somebody. And but it also has enough information that you don't have to go and you know try to search for what some term or some person's name means online. And it's also formal because we're dealing with uh, oftentimes events of real gravitas. And these events um, are then routed to the right clients, and then those clients receive them either on email or on the data miner app, um, as you can see on the right. So that's what we're building towards, and that's that gives you a sense of real time event detection. So we're going to take a step back <laughs> and uh, switch gears and talk about um, AI. So for those who have been avoiding the news the last three or four months, because I know AI has been in it for quite a bit and happy to answer questions about that. It's the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, translation between languages, and the list goes on and on. And all right, I, I grafted that from Wikipedia or a dictionary, but that's essentially right. Artificial intelligence is commonly thought of as a field of computer science, though it does have overlaps with math and cognitive science. And at its essence, there are tasks that humans do, which may seem mundane to very, very complex. Anything from how do you fill a glass of water to how do you write a, a survey report synthesizing 10 years of academic papers? Or how do you make a decision um, when you have uh, differing data on some sort of crisis response, you have to deploy your resources? And in artificial intelligence researchers are interested in figuring out how can we get computers to do these tasks? How do we get them to learn by themselves? And, um, and potentially even get to learn other tasks? And there's been a lot of progress, but there's still a long way to go. Now, AI, the field, can be broken down into several other subfields. And there's lots of ways of slicing and dicing things. And I found some, these are images you know, I, I did from Google searching that, that seem to be like very well agreed upon. So AI can be uh, split into machine learning, of which there's a subcategory called deep learning. Um, there's also natural language processing, getting computers to understand language. That tends to be my background, whether it's you know machine translation, uh, classifying text into like, is it positive or negative? Is it alertable or not? Uh, question answering, there's expert systems, speech recognition, where we get computers to take in speech and produce the text transcript of it and vice versa. Um, there are folks who work on computer vision, uh, doing image recognition, video recognition, there's robotics and planning, and the list goes on and on. And um, I, one thing I want to point out is that on the far left here, we have machine learning and we have deep learning. And deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. And the people that work on machine learning are, are really working on algorithms or methods for computers to learn uh, from observation, from data, from working with humans, maybe even other machines, 
to do a task. And it may be just a general purpose uh, learning method um, that could be applied to um, different modalities within AI. It could be applied to some text problems, could be uh, applied to some vision problems, et cetera. And so there's often this Venn diagram overlap um, between the things on the right and machine learning, um, because one's just a general learning approach. The other one are the actual application settings. So if you look to the right, you know, there's AI, then under AI, you have machine learning, under machine learning, you have deep learning. And then um, you have speech recognition and NLP in that blue uh, bubble overlaid, which means that, um, you know, if you're doing natural language processing, especially this day and age, you're doing some, you're doing machine learning and you're doing deep learning. And so oftentimes you'll even have, L you have NLP people that do a bunch of ML or DL and vice versa or some fusion. Um, so there's a lot of intermingling of the fields, but I'm going to get back to this a little bit later. Um, one, I, just because uh, my background is in NLP, um, you know, you know, I say we're trying to get computers to understand these different tasks and, and to give a scale of things, um, you know, I'm just understanding language and what people are saying, what their intent is, can often be hard. And here's just a choice example um, that people tend to use in intro to NLP classes, but I think it really drives the, home, the, the point home. So if you have, I saw the man on the hill with the telescope, um, give, it, give, give yourselves 15, 20 seconds. And I'm not sure if the chat function is, is working, but give me your best guess about what that sentence means. And you can like write in the chat. Or how would you interpret that sentence? That's actually a good way of uh, phrasing it. All right, I'm gonna. I have a next slide which which answers the questions. And essentially, um, there's several different interpretations. So the first one is, I saw the man on the hill. So there's a man on the hill. I saw them, that's me. And I used a telescope to see that man. Okay. And then another interpretation is number two. I saw the man. I was on the hill. I was using a telescope. And number three, I saw the man. Um, the man was on the hill. The hill had a telescope. And the list goes on and on. And so the simple sentence of basically about 10 words has several different interpretations. Um, all are actually fairly uh, legitimate or whatever. And so it, it begs the question, if this is hard for um, you know, humans to make sense of it and or even agree on things, imagine how difficult it is for a system. And uh, obviously this is a nice linguistics example right here, but if you think about how people post on social media or blogs, um, it tends to be noisier, uh, it tends to be more informal, slang is used, um, they're not trying to be very information precise. So that while they may not be saying sentences like this, the ambiguity will live on. And so that presents real challenges for systems that are trying to say, pull the needle out of the haystack and say, this is something that um, is actionable. All right, some real world applications. Um, some of these may be um, well known to you, but I, I wanted to walk through a bunch so we're all level set. So uh, a great example is... Uh, Machine translation. I have an example from Google Translate. But there's Bing and there's lots of other services that are online, uh, free or paid. And essentially in this, we want to take you into a sentence that's in one language here, it's French, and translate it into English. And the system hopefully does a good job of that. And this is a field that's been around um, since basically the 40s. And while people may take this for granted now, that's, yeah, it tends to work fairly well. It wasn't always the case. In fact, it wasn't working super well um, just across the board until several years ago. And part of that was because of deep learning and also other machine learning techniques. But a big driver of the success of, uh, you know, these translation systems is not only the algorithms that have been made and, you know, what it takes to run those algorithms and, of course, the people who develop them, but also um, the amount of data that it's, these models are trained on, which means these are the observations that the system takes in and then forms a model of the world from which it can, like, translate or do other tasks. And so uh, something like, um, here's an example, like Microsoft Research or Microsoft Translate um, about, I think it was about three, four years ago, had a paper where they said, we've, received, we've actually achieved human level performance uh, for translating between uh, Mandarin and English for news articles. Now, gr granted, that's actually a very specific translation pair for a very specific type of writing, but the fact that they, that they achieved parity with professionals was a big deal. And that, that just meant the floodgates were open. 
But um, you know, one thing that was in their paper was that they trained on well over a hundred million different examples of you know Mandarin English pairs. And that's a lot. That takes years to collect. It's a lot of money. And um, so these systems, which can do any language to any language, or like the top 100, top 200, um, just has millions and millions of examples at its disposal and systems that can learn from that. So that's something that's that's really important to keep in mind with developing these systems. Another one are um, you know, intelligent user interfaces or chatbots, et cetera, like such as Siri or Alexa, and the list goes on, where... Um, they not only just respond to whatever you just uh, you know wrote, but they understand what you're trying to do. What's the task you're trying to perform? And they can have a back and forth with you to fill in information and help you out, such as like booking a hotel, et cetera, and, and recognize when that task or that goal has been achieved. And under the hood, it's AI. Another one, moving away from text for a minute, uh, is um, you know using satellite imagery for damage assessment. So you feed the system pictures before and after uh, some sort of environmental, maybe it's a hurricane or maybe it's an earthquake, et cetera. Then, you, then the computer can take the satellite image and say like, all right, this quadrant has changed, this quadrant has changed, and identify is this residential area or is this some forested area of wetlands, et cetera. And then uh, folks can use that to form policy afterwards. And this can be all done automatically within milliseconds, essentially. <clears throat> Another one is in health. Uh, and there's lots of different angles here. I just listed a few. Um, one, one that's been pretty prominent is assistive diagnosis. So computers can actually um, go through and analyze the MRIs and x-rays at a very fast rate. And then that saves doctor's time. They, and the doctors can check over the results. Um, there's a lot of patient data that comes in when, when patients are at hospitals. And so like analyzing trends as they're, as they're connected, also useful. Um, it's great for early detection warnings, decision-making, uh, research into uh, making medicines. Um, there's also chatbots for like assistive living, et cetera. So there's all sorts of great applications for AI. And, and these are things that are actually used in the real world and people are pretty happy with the performance. And last but not least, there are autonomous uh, cars which can navigate uh, a city road and drive and get you to your destination. And, um, and of course, this has been years in the making, but one thing to understand is that this is a collection of many, many, many AI modules under the hood, each one taking one part of the driving task, doing a very good job of that. And then they're all working together um, to you know, steer essentially and navigate the city uh, as safely as possible. All right, I'm um, gonna to pivot to a brief history. I'm kind of going backwards in time, going from the general thing to the specific stuff. Um, so as I mentioned before, AI has been around since the 40s, 50s. And depending on who you talk to and how you want to view AI, there are some people who will list AI as starting in the 1800s or even earlier when um, this is pre-computer. But uh, even back then, there are mathematicians and scientists and philosophers who are thinking like, well, what does it mean to think? Uh, what does it mean to reason? And you know how do we codify like human behaviors, et cetera? And the, that actually laid the groundwork for a lot of the theoretical AI that sprung up, um, you know, post fifties, and so it, it it's it's very important. But you know, computers didn't really start becoming mainstream and usable until after World War II, and there's a period of time, you know, between the fifties and eighties where most of AI was focused on expert systems, and these were systems that were essentially rule based and heuristic driven. So uh, if you've ever taken a programming um, class or or maybe you know watch some stuff on TV, like there's you know, you can program and you can say like, if this happens, then do this. If it doesn't happen, then do this. And then you can start making this cascading tree. Like if you see this word, then it probably means this. So the machine should do this. Then the machine is basically a call and response. It's, you're, it's really dependent on the person who programmed it to really think through like the entire space of the task and have all these contingency plans um, to address things. And so uh, some of you might remember Eliza. That was one of the first kind of online um, AI systems, but it was essentially a heuristic system that um, the designer really thought through, uh, you know, what words to pick out, where, how to detect questions, um, so that a user who is, you know, talking to Eliza, who's supposed to be um, a psychotherapist, would feel listened to, would feel engaged with, 
And um, was it perfect? No, but for that time, people were very impressed with it because it had this sort of human-like ability, even though it was just a collection of if-then-elses. Um, and you can still find it online, actually. People have coded it up. Um, on to the left, you know, there's an example of someone operating a very old computer, but I had this photo um, from taken from a website which was describing some of the early machine translation systems. So some of the, the earliest natural language processing techniques um, or the field was basically birthed from people wanting to do machine translation during the Cold War. And so as you can imagine, um, you know, Russia wanted to understand what was happening in English. Um, you know, the West, a little bit more uh, English-centric, also wanted to understand Russia. So those were the two languages that people were doing research on because they were getting a lot of government funding. And within the first year, there are people who made these very rule-based systems that said, if you see this word, look it up in the dictionary and flip it to the Russian equivalent and maybe do some transformations. And on computers that are just really like our, our cell phones now dwarf them. And they achieved, like they had examples where it was working well for some complex examples, um, but they're extremely brittle. And after four years of plugging away at this, even though people are very, people, researchers around the world felt we're gonna solve this problem very, very soon. Um, after years of grinding, I, the enthusiasm waned a bit. And at least in the US, the government said like, this, this isn't going anywhere. We're actually gonna like put a pause on funding this stuff. So it's, you know, when you see the examples of, you know, Google Translate or Bing Translate and the, all the other translation engines, which are fantastic, note that it has its roots 70 years ago and that it's gone through some up and downs to get to where we are now. But essentially, ex, you know, my anecdotes aside, um, some really, really simple systems, some really simple compute power, but people were already figuring out how to do some really creative things. Um, next up is machine learning, and uh, which is a subfield of AI. And it was really born out of the idea that, all right, we can have people, domain experts, sit down and just try to enumerate all the different ways that, a, all the different scenarios that a system might encounter, um, and then, you know, hope that we've covered the space. But what happens is a as a task uh, gaining complexity, there's just not enough time or expertise to actually enumerate all the possible scenarios. And so people started drifting back to the idea of like, how do we get computers to learn this stuff like a human would? Um, or even, even just a fraction of what a domain expert could do would be fantastic. And so this nice little chart on the left shows all the different types of learning approaches. And for the, for the layperson, the way I like, like to explain things to people is that you might remember when you, know, you were in school and you maybe had, this is the way I learned best, or maybe you focus for an hour, take a break, or maybe you do memorization, you have flashcards, or maybe you like make sure to partner with a peer, or maybe you're mentoring folks now and you have different ways of teaching them. Uh, whether it might be classroom instruction, um, just touring them out in the field, um, seeing how they do and learn on assignment. There's all these different ways of learning and there's different ways of teaching. And a lot of the machine uh, learning approaches have parallels with how people learn as well. Like maybe they learn from lots of examples, um, maybe they're paired up with a domain expert, uh, they're given feedback constantly, or maybe they're not given feedback uh, at all or just very minimally. And so different researchers worked on different ways of getting computers to learn when there's not a lot of data or when there is a lot of data or human intervention. And so those all those bubbles are the different types of approaches, more or less. And then in the last 10 years, deep learning has been uh, the hot thing and for good reason. And there's been it's been especially in the news lately. And I should note that ML and DL, they've been around since the 60s or 70s, at least in very simple mathematical constructs, but it wasn't until certain epochs of time that um, the compute power ca caught up or there was enough data that their power could actually be used. And that was essentially the case of deep learning, where um, neural networks, which is the foundation of deep learning, had been around since the 60s and 70s. Um, but it wasn't until uh, people realized that they could use GPUs, which are like these graphic hearts computers, which could do all these very complex mathematical operations very quickly in that scale, coupled with there being just lots of data that you know people in industry and academia had been compiling for systems to learn from, that deep learning really took off for speech, for images, for NLP, and other tasks. And the, the fundamental difference between the two, though deep learning is a subset of machine learning, is that in machine learning, um, if you want people to, uh, if you want to detect whether a, a photo is a car or not, you know, there'd be some domain experts who would sit down and say like, all right, what are all the different ways that a human might uh, detect whether this is a car or not? Maybe like the presence of a wheel or the presence of a road. Um, and they, those are essentially features. So you have enough features there. And then the system would actually try to calculate these features and say like, I see a wheel. I see a door that might be a car. And then and it starts to weight these different features 
depending on the examples it's seen. And then just to tell whether it's a car or not car. Um, with deep learning, um, you don't have to do that intensive feature extraction by the human, uh, which is one of its advantages and draws. So the co more complex the task is, you need to have experts that sit down and really say like, these are all the features that really describe this task. And deep learning, you give it the data and it'll actually figure out the features and then do the classification, say this is a car or not car. So there's a lot of great properties in that regard, but you know, you do need some domain expertise, or at least deep learning expertise to construct that algorithm. And you also need the data in hand. So what does AI do well? Well, a few things, and some of these are slanted towards the real-time event detection use case, but um, it, it does process large amounts of heterogeneous data can do it from all over the world in real time, whether it's text, different modalities, languages, images, videos, et cetera. Um, it's really good at doing classification events well, where you want to say like, hey, this piece of text came in. I want to categorize into like one of these five categories, or maybe one of these 200 categories. Um, and it tends to do, do those things quite well. Uh, it can rank things uh, well, especially when that list is long, which may be more challenging for humans to do. And finally, it can deliver the right content to the right places. So if you ever have, um, if you're using, you know, mu streaming music services or uh, streaming movie TV services, and they say like, hey, we're going to recommend this to you. And, you know, depending on how you set things up, it can actually be quite effective because it's looking at what you viewed before. It's looking at what your peers have viewed um, and, you know, sprinkling in a little bit of randomness. But these recommendation algorithms have been for, around for a while and they're powering a lot of, you know, what we see online today. So it, it does a decent job with that stuff. And this is an important point to bring up because, you know, from the, from the real-time event detection point of view, such as companies such as data miners, we want to make sure that the clients are getting the right alerts, um, even if they didn't think to ask for them. Of course, there's no free lunch. That's number two, I've said that today. Um, where does AI have problems? So AI systems that are trained for one task, say identifying a disaster vehicle, don't always work well when going to another task. Even that task is very, very similar, such as identifying whether the type of natural disaster, or even if there is a natural disaster. And, and that's just, it, they're brittle. It has been improving. And there's there's been a lot of headway the last year or so. But um, oftentimes, you know, going back to the autonomous driving vehicle, there's specific AI models that will just be focused on one particular part of some part of a problem. And if you have enough of those covering all the different subparts, you can aggregate them and, uh, and they can perform well. Um, it doesn't do con common sense reasoning that well. That's something, you know, AI people are still working on trying to get computers to understand, you know, if you hold something in the air, it drops to the ground if you've uh, stopped holding it. And, um, and that can rear its head for uh, real life tasks where, you know, you, you, a human may understand causality very well. Like if this happened, then this must have happened beforehand. Um, you know, that, for example, if there's um, you know smoke up in the air, it probably means there's fire, and that a fire was started. And that that's you know we wouldn't even think twice about that. But that can be tricky for a, a system to understand right off the go. Um, another one are complex tasks. Obviously, complex tasks are complex. They're hard. But there are tasks where the goalposts, the rubric the definition may be changing over the course of an event or over the course of the task. And that poses problems to systems to be, to be adaptable. Um, but I want to finish up this one slide saying, you know, there's, there's always stuff in the news about saying like AI has solved this and AI does this at this performance. And, and even though I've been in this field for a while, I'm very excited about the developments that I make or my team makes or that I see elsewhere in the world that you always have to take things with a grain of salt that AI hasn't been solved. So if someone says that to you, you know, you might want to just kind of slowly back away from the conversation. But um, it does some things very well that uh, even now that I didn't do two years ago or definitely 20 years ago, um, and such as translation or image detection. And that's really, really exciting. And of course, things will keep getting better as more people work on these problems. But, you know, there's where we are now, where we were before, and also where we might be. All right, next subsection is developing an AI system. So we've heard about you know, some examples of how this is used. Um, history of AI, hopefully I've delineated kind of like what these learning methods are, or at least like at a, a big level, big picture level, like you know, there's different methods that people use to learn. Personally, there's different methods that computers get to learn. And so how do we use that knowledge to develop an AI system that could do X? Here we go. So when people usually think about uh, developing AI systems, or at least you know the stuff that's reported in the news about, hey, this new algorithm that came out and it can do X, Y, and Z, 
Um, oftentimes, the the organization that developed it is highlighted. Uh, maybe the scientists and managers are highlighted, um, and that's really exciting. Um, you know, something that's the two things that are really not higher uh, highlighted are the data in the compute. So a lot of these models these days, especially deep learning ones, tend to be very large, and you need a lot of computing processing power to run them at scale. To actually train them with these learning algorithms, then once it's trained up, give them examples and ask it to do something to those examples, classify or generate whatever. Um, and so that's often not spoken about in you know, kind of the general articles. And then there's also the data perspective. And as I mentioned before, um, a lot of these AI models and systems are very data hungry. Um, these machine translations, translation systems are trained upwards of hundreds of millions of sentence pairs, right? This is an example in French, the same example in English. And, um, and some systems are trained on even more. And so one of the dirty little secrets about AI is that it is trained on a lot of data. Some of that data took uh, months, maybe even years, in some cases, even decades to collect and just aggregate and build up over time, but also have humans in the loop to actually label the data and say like, hey, this is... This is this English translation of this French sentence. This is this Mandarin translation of this Russian sentence and so forth. And that's that's a very costly and time-consuming endeavor. And you know, one of the th challenges for scientists and engineers designing things to figure out, given the amount of data I have, what are the best models to pair with that amount of data? In a perfect world, I have a ton of data and then you know, the modeling actually gets easier. But a lot in the perfect world doesn't happen all that often. So a lot of times your data is noisy or it's going to take too long to get labels for it. And then you have to be clever and develop new AI models that can work on the limited amount of data that you have. The final thing that often goes unsaid uh, when reading about AI in the news is about domain experts. And um, these are people that may not be the AI practitioners or designers, but they know about the task. And so, um, you know, one, one actually one area where it does pop up a lot is in hate speech or uh, offensive language detection on forums. And, and there's a lot of experts that say, they will weigh in and say, this is this, this is this actually hate speech, this hate speech towards this group. And sometimes it's very subtle and nuanced. And, um, and in a best case scenario, they're often in the loop working side and side with the scientists and engineers. So these models won't make mistakes on misclassifying things. And the same, time, same thing for real-time event detection, whether it's public safety or um, these physical safety events or you know, other types of events that DataWiner works on, we actually leverage our domain experts um, who have you know decades in the field from whatever area that you know they come from journalism, you know, state department, uh, you know different organizations, um, so that they can better inform these the models that we develop. And all right, so how do AI systems learn? Well, we already know there's a class of these learning algorithms, and, and I've kind of hand waved here. And, and for our purposes here, I really want to want you to treat them as black boxes. The thing is, there's lots of different black boxes. And the metaphor I've been using for the last few months when explaining things to folks is you can think about these different learning models uh, as different types of engines you might put in a car. And, um, and of course, there's different cars may require different engines. If you want to go off-roading or if you, you know, are just doing short trips or you're designing a race car, you're going to want a different engine for, for the task at hand. And that's essentially um, how to view these different models. And, and here are just a few of like the common like building block deep learning models that folks in NLP have used for the last five or six years. You have convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, long short-term memory networks. You have transformers, which are essentially um, aggregates of the LSTMs, which are essentially variants of the RNNs. And so each one of these has built on the other and, and become increasingly more powerful and more performant. But it's really up to um, the systems designer to say like, hey, you know, this is the problem I have. This is the data I have. And this is which model I'm going to use. So which approach is best? I guess I was already leading into this. You know, it really depends on your problem and the resources available. Uh, you know, if you're building a house or some sort of a structure, you're going to have a toolbox, have lots of different tools that will do very specific things. But not every tool is going to be used for every project when you're building the house. You're going to be using a hammer to to punch in nails and take out nails. And you're gonna be using a software, different things. And that's really how to view these different algorithms is that given the problem at hand with all the different constraints, you're gonna look in your toolbox and pick the best tool for that uh, thing. So, um, you know, I mentioned these expert rule-based systems uh, that were in the 50s and 80s before, which seems out of fad now, but they're still actually used in industrial systems. And the reason is that they can actually be very effective in specific situations. 
um, you know, either because the task is super easy, you can spend a couple hours writing the rules out and really explore the space. Why spend all the time making a deep learning model? And also times some of these models make systematic errors and you can make a rule-based approach to just check them right before the output goes up. And so most industrial deployments use deep learning models actually in conjunction with rule-based approaches. It's been the case with every company I've been in. Um, and I imagine it's gonna be the case for a very long time. The other thing to keep in mind is the importance of data. And I've already, I think I've been the, the horse here that says, you know, having a lot of data is key, but I also wanna note that having the right data is key. And I mentioned things about labeling the data. And so um, say I wanted to develop a model which detects in real time, whether an incoming piece of text is potentially of interest to clients. You know, is this something that's alertable or not? Is this event alertable or it's not? If it is alertable, then you know, I'd probably wanna send it to clients. And so something like my house surrounded by floods in Long Fork, that's alertable. We are trapped with large amounts of surge outside our door, alertable. But the other two aren't alertable. We saw them before. And what we wanted, what these AI models will do is say, give us as many examples as you can of things that are alertable and things that are not alertable. So it would look at this data set, small data set of four examples, and then and start trying to figure out the saying, like, all right, you know, I see flood is actually co-located with the alertable tag a lot. So it's going to increase its weight of flood to be alertable. Um, whereas maybe Taylor is something that is going to be associated with non-alertable. Then, you know, this is just four examples. So you keep sending it more and more examples, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions in some cases. And the system will start adjusting, setting all these weights for different words, different tokens it sees, maybe even different phrases. And we'll do that automatically. And we'll start to figure out like what's important and what's not important in terms of making a decision of whether something is alertable or not alertable. And, and of course, if you're getting to the millions range or even thousands, Someone needs to sit down for each of the messages and say, this is alertable, this is not alertable. It takes time, may take some domain expertise. And so, uh, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, figuring out like, well, how much data do you really need to do? You don't want to do a million if you can get away with 5,000 or even 500. And so that's that's kind of the, the research quandary that a lot of AI model developers face is, you know, there's a lot of fancy models out there, but if they require millions and you don't have that and you don't have a year to collect it or the money, how do you do it? And so that's the research challenge. Um, yeah, and, and, and basically, you know, uh, in some cases, creating that data can take even longer than developing the AI model. And so once again, I just want to underline the importance of the human experts in this AI development process. All right, so we're going to skip over to the third part of the talk, and uh, which is AI for real-time event detection. I'm also watching the time here, and I, I want to leave time for, for questions. Um, as mentioned before, you know, setting up an AI platform, there's all sorts of data sources that come in. It goes to your AI platform, and then the alerts go out. And you know, I'll skip through these slides. So within an AI org at Data Miner, and this is you know, a traditional thing, a research structure that other organizations may have. This is very similar to what I had when I was a scientist at Yahoo Labs and, and uh, other companies, is that you'll have an applied research group. Uh, there'll be an AI engineering group that takes these models and actually figures out the best way to deploy them and optimize them. So uh, they run at cost. And um, there's data science group, which takes these models and expands them to different languages and different domains. And there's an innovation group, which says, hey, for real-time event alerting, you know, what are some of the things two years, three years down the road that um, could be a game changer for our clients? And you know, it's really eclectic. There's a, obviously in research, you get a lot of people with PhDs in computer science, but you know, for us, there's a really diverse group of backgrounds going to neurosciences, science cog sci, people with master's degree from EE, engineers, designers, front end engineers, product managers. So real diverse, diverse group of people because real time event detection requires like a lot of di diverse opinions and uh, insight. And what does an AI scientist do it do? You know, in, in, at data mine, but again, it's it's similar across the board. Main thing is if you're an applied scientist, you're really thinking about how what how do you build and deploy AI models. So you scope the problem, you collect the data, you experiment rapidly with different of these types of uh, AI engines. Then you evaluate. If things look good, then you're going to deploy the models. And they'll also research and develop novel algorithms so that maybe they'll come up with the next engine um, to suit our purposes for real-time event detection and also provide internal thought leadership. So you know while we develop models that can detect whether there's the presence of a flood in an image or extract out the location of uh, from a piece of text, you know, there's also things where we can do statistics analyses and provide you know, historical insights 
um, based on data we collected before for different teams. Now, externally, um, you know, then it starts looking more like what you would expect from an academic lab. Uh, you know, we publish peer-reviewed research papers. Uh, we try to focus it on crisis event and AI for social good. We organize AI conferences and workshops. You can see a couple of them below. We've actually, over the last few years, sponsored or organized um, several workshops on AI for emergency response. Um, one, because it's what we do, but two, we really want to get this subfield of the AI for social good or AI work out there and other researchers, researchers exposed to it. Like we really want people to get into this area and get excited about it because the more people that work on it, the more advances that can be made. And that's also why we publish. And in real time at AI at Data Miner, because we ingest so many different sources, 500,000 plus, um, and they're coming in at different modalities, computer vision, images, text, audio, speech, machine and sensor data, we have different teams actually make algorithms and methods that can extract the information, do the alertability, and then send the alerts out for these different modalities. I just wanna give you a few examples. So in the computer vision one, an image may come in like this, and we have several AI models, and this is just a few of them, but that would process this image in real time as soon as it comes in. One would say, hey, is this image a photograph or is it maybe someone's drawing or something? Um, does this actually have the presence of a fire in it? Then there's this detection and extraction algorithms that would say like, all right, give me all the logos that are in the image. Uh, if there's any text that's in the image, detect it, but then uh, send it back to me. That We call that uh, OCR. And then also detect any of the objects of interest in that image. So it could be fire truck, firefighter, fire smoke. And while all the things that are extracted on the right-hand side may not be um, immediately useful or useful at all to first responders, you know, we're extracting them out because they might be useful to other folks, people who care about their company is on fire or, um, you know, vanfire.org, which uh, has, you know, is the, the brand of the fire truck there might be interested that, hey, like this was actually used to put out a fire that's exciting, let's retweet it or something, um, or might want to give help to that particular location. Um, but then the presence of different uh, crisis response teams, that might be great for news, might be great for other crisis response teams, um, and other people in the area to maybe like stay away from uh, this fire. So there's lots of different ways that just a few of these AI, AI algorithms paired with this one image can be used to provide real-time event detection. And on the text side, we actually, because there's a lot of text that comes in, uh, we have many, many different AI models under the hood. I'm just gonna give some high level examples here. But if you have this uh, example, social media message that comes in about you know, the surge flooding outside Fort Myers, um, you know, it's going, that message will be also sent to a collection of models. Here's just three of them. One that says, is this alertable or not? Another one that extracts out um, the event in this case, it's a flood, flooding event, and then also extracts out the geography. So we want to know where this is so people will know what to do with it and where to go. So Fort Myers downtown. It's not the most specific one, but at least you can triangulate that. And then once these three things are calculated, as well as a whole host of other um, attributes, that information, as well as the original text, is sent to an alert generation module that says, all right, given this original piece of text, all these other things that we now understand about that text let me write that one to two sentence summary of that event. Um, it's formal, it's in English, it's information precise. And then let's route it to the right clients. And that alert, alert generation technology is very similar to the machine translation technology that you see for these translation um, systems because it's essentially taking this really informal piece of text and making a formal English one. And once again, all of these things, uh, we're training on a lot of data. And one of the great things about being a data miner is that we have actually, we've been around long enough that we have a lot of data collected that we can use for these systems. And, you know, one, one question that, you know, sometimes people ask this is, you know, well, what are performance numbers? Obviously, I can't share uh, what the exact performance of these things are, but when people publish on these things um, in the academic literature, whether it's us or others, you know, um, something like this one can be done at a very, very high accuracy if you have enough data, like high 90s, mid 90s, et cetera, um, detecting the flood uh, or detecting the event, depending on the, your event space, it could be just a dozen or it could be several hundred, um, can also be done at a very high accuracy in the 90s. And then detecting the geography, it's a more challenging one. There's lots of different ways of expressing that, um, especially all over the world, a bit more challenging, maybe not as high as the other ones, but it is doable at a reasonable accuracy. And so just that's giving you a, a flash of some of the things that we see now, but it also illustrates just how all these different AI models are just 
running as soon as a message comes in, and then they're interacting and decisions are made quick, very, very quickly. And then within 40 to 60 seconds, you know, an alert is sent out the door. And I, I think it has a lot of analogies with the autonomous driving case where you have a lot of AI models under the hood, no pun intended, all working in concert to move the car. Um, and so some of the things that we look to the future include multimodal fusion AI, where you're taking things from different modalities, different messages, and not treating them in isolation, but connecting the dots to see how they're related. This is something that a domain expert can do very quickly and understand, hey, all of these things happen in the same amount of time, relatively in the same location, and they're just different aspects of what's going on with the event as it transpires. It's still very challenging for a system to do, but it's one of the things that we're really excited and are working on. And so in this case, reading from left to right, you know, some sensor data shows that a, uh, a plane actually just had an abrupt end to a flight path. That's concerning. Um, dispatch officers are, are being sent. You have some audio scanner data from that. Um, then people are posting on social media, whether images, there's smoke over there, there's an explosion that we heard. And it's all corroborating evidence that says like, hey, something is transpiring and this is how it's transpiring. And that's information that can be disseminated out. And I'm going to kind of go through this slide quickly. Um, I want to return to the fact that, you know, I talked a lot about AI, but I, I feel, you know, at, at the core that when you're doing real-time event detection and you're doing these really high stakes uh, types of tasks, it's, while the AI can work well for certain quadrants of the task space, you know, when it's a matter of life and death, you know, it's really important to have humans in the loop, especially experts that can check things before they go out the door. And, and that's what we have in data miner. Like humans are in different loops of the AI pli the pipeline, checking things, corroborating things, and doing things very quickly. Um, so the AI system, whatever we send out is actually fairly accurate, but the AI system can also learn from that as well. And we also leverage this robust, alert, uh, robust alerting data over 10 plus years, a knowledge platform to really make this stuff come together. And it's a cycle. So what we do actually empowers our human experts and vice versa. And um, I'm just gonna skip to my last case study here for the sake of time. You know, I, I had a, that example timeline. I just wanna return to it be, to ground things again. So knowing what we know about uh, you know, AI and real-time event detection and how we have all these different AI models trained on different types of data doing particular aspects of the task, I think you see how this starts coming together where to develop a timeline um, such as this one where you have a flash flood after major rainfall in Eastern Kentucky, there are people that were killed, people that were missing, lots of people that were injured. Um, again, making this sort of subsection timeline, you can see people already reporting no electricity, roads are, are not happening, their houses are surrounded, residents are washed away. This is all within like 30 minutes. And, um, and this is stuff that our, you know, a real-time event, event detection system can detect and send out within a minute. And, and then of course you have the other stuff to the right, which are, you know, people reporting about uh, government statements and, you know, National Guard, et cetera. But the ability to aggregate all this information and put it out very quickly, um, you know, one by one, and then, of course, aggregate in this nice timeline, the purpose of this slide is, I think, really one of the advantages of having AI in the loop for, um, you know, doing this real-time event detection. So to wrap things up, uh, you know, going back to what I was saying in the beginning, there's just a lot of data that's out there. And you know, it's sort of a blessing and a curse. The blessing part, it presents a real opportunity for real-time event detection to be even performant than it was before. Because if more people are saying, this is what's happening in the world about events that we care about, and that means there's more information that we can get out to the right people to form strategy and tactics. On the flip side, the curse part is that this increase in volume of signals makes it really hard for even the most expert and hardest working human team to process this. There's just too much volume to go through. A lot of it is noise. So this is where AI can step in. And I think we're at a point, in, you know, we've proven this out, where AI can do things that perform well at scale and it's, a fa and it's fast. And it can do a lot of these low-hanging fruit type tasks very effectively and humans may not even have to be involved. So, you know, the thing with real-time event detection 2023 is really designing these learning systems where both parties can actually work together. So at Dataminer, we've been developing state-of-the-art AI techniques with our experts in the loop to detect and alert on meaningful events in real time. This works across different languages and modalities. And our first alert product works in the public sector, which is you know, part of the reason we're here. Um, and you know, finally, real-time event detection is, is really one of the most challenging AI problems. And a lot of people say mine's the most challenging problem. But this one really just has like the trifecta of different challenges. And again, there's no free lunch. But uh, you know, it really has to cover different modalities, has to be different languages. You know, if you remember my example about the man on the hill, 
that's what the systems have to deal with all the time, but then have to actually make really concrete decisions about, and which can in, sometimes influence life or, life or death. And it has to do this really, really fast and at scale. So a lot of systems may have just one of these things that they focus on, um, but in this type of task, you really have to do all of these fairly well um, to do very well overall. So it's a challenge, but I also think it's a great opportunity. It's actually one of the reasons I joined Data Miner was like, this is a unique thing to really push what AI can do, but of course has this great AI for good angle um, for helping the public sector. So, um, you know, Eric Schweitzer, who's our uh, one of our marketing managers at Data Miner, he was here and he can also talk about uh, First Alert, but it's one of, it's one of our real-time event detection uh, services. It allows you to respond quickly and act confidently on a lot of these, um, you know, public safety incidents. And finally, you know, this this actually happened when I was at uh, NAPSIG, but you know, Data Miner has expanded its social good efforts with its crisis response program to create support for nonprofits on the front lines of emergency response operations. So when you're done, you can sort of search for that if it's uh, applicable to you. And that's it. Thank you for listening uh, for my fly-by-night overview of AI. <laughs> and um, I know I know we're getting a little tight on time, so happy to answer questions. Also happy to stay, stay a little bit later if that works. And if people can also send me questions or email or to NAPSIG, I'm also happy to answer them offline. Yeah, if people want to um, type any additional questions into um, the Q&A section, we'll send them to Joel and have him answer them, and we'll include those. Um, but what I'll do is maybe what I'll do is just try to um, touch on a couple um, that I think are particularly relevant. Um, so Joel, first one is, are you aware of AI getting used for predicting potential cascading impacts during an incident like disruption of critical infrastructure slash services? And I think you touched on that a little bit with the Kentucky flooding, but if you can expand on that a little bit, it'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, AI can be used to that, used to do that. And that's not something that we do at Data Miner, uh, because there's there's they're saying this is what happened in the world. It's up to you to, to decide. And there's also predicting what could happen. Those are very two different tasks and use cases. But um, I know in other industries, this is a thing that definitely happens. And uh yeah, it, it wouldn't be unsurprising. I th I think, you know, given how some events unfold. Uh, where there could be flooding and that touches upon electric generator. I, I think it's within the realm of AI to be able to predict um, some of these things. Again, it comes down to data and expertise, right? Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and that may lead into um, one in the Kentucky flooding case studies are a great example as well. Um, uh, a common question really is AI and machine learning are very good at finding patterns in data. Um, do you have any thoughts or insights on how this might be used um, for search and rescue operations? And, and um, part of that context that I found that interesting is that flooding in Kentucky, uh, the flooding event in Kentucky, um, NAPSIG deployed our SARCOP tool, which is our search and rescue common operating platform. Um, and it'd be interesting just to see how you might, if you have um, thought about AI uh, relative to search and rescue operations. Yeah, that's uh, all right. So, uh, not precisely, but I, I feel like it could definitely be used. And that, that's a little pushing outside what data miners bread and butter is right now. But um, I, I think there could be good use cases there. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to actually dream up something on the spot, but that's uh, okay. It, yeah, it's yeah. more <laughs> of if, if you had if you had something, that'd be great. But um, we also have Jared Doak from Napsig actually um, on this call. And maybe that's something that we dig in with you a little bit because yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. The, the, the advances that we're just seeing in search and rescue and deploying geospatial tools and information is, is just really advancing quickly. And it would be great to see how we can speed that up even further. Um, yeah, with, I think, yeah, hmm? yeah, go ahead. No, no, no sorry, I was, sorry. I, I was just going to say with that, I, I think we're probably going to try to cut this at um, right on the hour, just to, to keep it um, folks not uh, dropping off too quickly. But um, as mentioned, we will um, send the Q&A to Data Miner and they can, um, Joel and Eric can uh, provide some written answers. Uh, and that will be posted as part of the uh, materials that you'll see next week on the website. Um, I'd just like to close and say a huge thank you to you, Joel, and to Data Miner in particular. My pleasure. Um, I, I, you know, I am definitely not your target audience and you make AI really easy for someone like me to understand. So I think you've, you've mastered to be able to uh, communicate to folks who probably are highly technical as well as folks who are just trying to get up to speed. So 
a, a huge thanks. I think this is an exciting field and an exciting um, activities that you and both Dataminer are doing. Um, and you know, we just love to keep you um, as part of uh, our network and folks that uh, have more questions will absolutely direct them towards you. All right, thank um, you. And we really appreciate the opportunity to partner and also the opportunity to give a presentation on this. It's always, you know, I often giving presentations at, you know, AI conferences or, you know, things of this ilk, but it's really exciting when, you know, they're, you're talking about a technology and then people are actually using it and benefiting from it. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. And and as we always like to do, big thank you to everyone who logged in. Um, we know you have busy schedules and we really appreciate your time and your focus. Um, a lot of great questions and comments and uh, we will reply to those. Uh, and please always remember that NAPSIG Foundation is here to help you, our community. So if there's anything you need ever, please reach out to me directly and, and we're here to help. Um, and with that, we will close the uh, prep tech talk and just a big thank you again to everyone who participated and to Joel and to Dave. Thank you, everyone. Bye.